Okay, let's get started. Um, thank you for coming. As I mentioned a few moments ago, you can download the handout at this bit.ly URL. So there's going to be a lot of facts and figures and tables and graphs and charts and things like that, so you're going to want to download it sooner than later. Um, and here's our agenda. I want, to, <laughs> I want to tell you why I dove into this mess. Um, and then we'll talk about hardware codecs for producing H.264 and some hardware codecs for producing ATVC. So did not get to BP9 this time around. So the theory of testing, from my perspective, is that cloud transcoding is the optimal workload for a lot of live producers. So if you can get one good stream out of the building and then transcode it in the cloud, it's a lot more efficient than trying to encode all your encoding ladder and get that out to the cloud. So that being the case, you have two options in the cloud. You can go software or hardware. Um, software requires a very expensive cloud computer with lots of CPUs. And hardware, whether it's a GPU or a field programmable gate array, requires lower CPU, but it may cost more because they charge more for hardware. Um, so the question I wanted to answer was, how do the CPU only and hardware systems compare quality-wise and cost-wise? And that was kind of the overview that I wanted to take to this. That's what I wanted to learn. And the answers were, from a quality perspective, I found that the hardware stacks up pretty well. <laughs> and the cost perspective was complicated. You know, I had envisioned that I could find one cloud instance that I could price and use for all my test encodes, and then I'd know, okay, well, this is what it costs. This is my throughput, you know, I, and I could compare costs that way. But the, as it turned out, I used different computers for almost every encode. Some of them were on AWS, some of them were not on AWS. So coming up with comparative pricing was very problematic. And uh, you're going to have to do your own work there. But I think I provide a structure and a lot of clues as to what to look for that will help you in that effort. And, and what I tried to do is I tried to derive the most practical encoding configuration for each technology. You know, what presets, what parameters to use in the command string. And then I tested the capacity using a full encoding ladder, right? So it's, because that's what we care about, right? We care about how many encoding ladders can we push through this hardware platform, whether it's software or hardware only. So I created an encoding ladder, created my optimum encoding parameters, tested capacity on each system using that encoding ladder. And with hardware, I didn't tolerate any drop frames. And with software, as long as the software got 55 frames per second or higher, that was acceptable. And you'll see what I mean throughout the presentation. And once I understood what the configurations were, I used traditional rate distortion curve analysis to, to test the quality of the codec. So I didn't look at the encoding lambda that I produced. I did a separate round of encodes at 1, 2, 3, 4 megabits per second. And then I looked at the rate distortion from those encodes. And again, as you saw in the first slide, I started with H.264 and then I went to AGVC. With H.264, I looked at four different technologies, or really three, but one was two ways. I looked at NVIDIA, the NVNC uh, hardware codec. I looked at Intel QuickSync, and then I looked at X.264 in medium and, and very fast, because those are the those tend to be the quality levels that people want to compare to. So basically, it's, you know, how well does the quality compare, how well does the throughput compare to those uh, X.264 software-only encodes. So for, for the NVIDIA encodes, the instance was selected and configured by engineers at SoftVellum. SoftVellum um, produces a product called the Nimble Streamer, which is a cloud transcoding platform. So one of the things I didn't understand was how, I'm a pretty good encoding professional, but I'm not a coder. I can't compile code. So one of the, one of the issues I faced was how do, I get, how do I get up and running instances of these uh, hardware and software test beds if I, don't, if, I, if I can't do that myself? And one of the, I read some, some documentation that Nimble Streamer and SoftVellum produced that showed that they were working with the NBank codec and I said, can you guys help me get this set up? And they did. The reason they're interested in this, of course, is because a lot of their customers 
transcode in the cloud and they want to explore hardware. So they knew how to configure the system, they knew some of the settings, so they helped me get it set up. And the instance that they chose was a, was a G34 extra large. So this is a, a graphics optimized computer. This guy right here with one GPU, 16 cores, and you see the memory configurations. Most important, it cost a buck 14 an hour. Okay, so you know, we, we see how many instances it can, or how many encoding letters it can produce. We compare it to a buck 14, we understand what the, what the cost per encoding letter is. Now, when you're working with the NVIDIA hardware codec, the best source I found was this white paper available on the NVIDIA website. And the, the command string that they recommended was this. And this was the starting point for all of the encodes that, um, that I produced with NVIDIA. A couple of things scared me here. Uh, First, I was concerned that throughput would be a little bit slow if I used the slow preset. So I wanted to experiment with, with the medium preset. And then I was also concerned that there may be too much variation in the bitstream if we had a maximum rate of essentially 2x the data rate. So what I did is I switched to one second VBB buffer. So this is the two second buffer. This is a this is a program called Bitrate Viewer, and here we're looking at the data rate and the, the individual GOPs in the test file that I produced with the two-second buffer. And we see that there's a little bit of variation here, nothing dramatic, but that tends to really get minimized when you use a shorter buffer. So I use the one-second buffer in my tests, and and then I tried the medium preset to, to optimize capacity. Again, I was concerned that if I use the slow preset, I may not get as much throughput through the machine as I would like. Of course, when you change the preset, you want to understand what the quality hit is. And the quality dropped from 82.35 to 82.19 VMAX score, so that's pretty much insignificant. The next thing I wanted to check was for any transient quality issues, because sometimes when you use faster presets, we see this sometimes with x.264 and x.265, if you use the ultra-fast or the very fast presets, you start to see dramatic drops in quality for one or two frames that can degrade the quality of experience. So what we're looking at here is a tool called the, uh, the Moscow State University Video Quality Measurement Tool. We're looking at the VMAF scores over the duration of the entire two files. This is a two-minute test file. We encode the file, we store it off, we measure the VMAF, and what's red is the original white paper spec. So this is slow with a 2x um, VBV buffer, and this is CBR, so I changed it to one second VBV buffer and the medium preset instead of the um, slow preset. So green is the newer encode, red is the recommended encode, and what I was looking for was any significant drops in quality. And if I zoomed in here, that looks pretty scary. That tells me that you know, the score is dropping down significantly. But if I looked at the actual frames at that location, I didn't see any significant differences. So that told me it was, you know, I'm glad I checked, but there was nothing there. So I ended up, I ended up um, going with this configuration. So I started off playing around with X.264, or, or here's the X.264 medium results. Here's the original white paper recommendations. Here's white paper recommendations with um, using the slow <coughs> preset, and here's the and CBR, and here's CBR and medium. And we're seeing the difference in bit rate is insignificant. The peak bit rate, the white paper, I mean, there's not a huge difference here, but we did get the peak bit rate down from 5.4 to 5123, which is what my target was. Again, the original. The VMAF score for the white paper was 81.82. We increased that a little bit with 82.35, and, and this is the number that we ended up with. And then you see the PSNR. In terms of CPU utilization, I saw very little difference in CPU utilization between the medium and the slow preset. So that didn't really seem to change the, the outcome at all. <coughs> 
And then here's the encoding ladder that I tested with. And, and you're going to have your own encoding ladder. And at the end, we'll talk about what my recommendations are. But basically, this is the encoding ladder that I used to test how many instances of this I could produce on any given system. So we had one rung at 1080p 60 at 6 megabits, one at 1080p 30, 4 megabits, 720p 30, 2.5, 540p 1.2, and, and 360p. So I set this up in a command string, tried to run this on each system, and then um, s determine what the capacity was. And here's the actual command string that I used to produce the, um, the rate distortion curve clips, so the clips I analyzed in the, in the rate distortion curve, not the, not the uh, capacity test. And all the hardware codecs need to input some type of uncompressed format. So the first thing you see here is they're, they're basically decompressing the file into this format, and they're inputting that. Um, and then here's the preset change from the original white paper. Here's the buffer size change from the original white paper. And the rest is pretty much as they recommended. And on the, on the uh, G34 extra large, I was able to achieve two 60 frame per second encodes of the entire encoding ladder. So the unit cost me a buck 14 an hour. I was able to produce two full encoding ladders on that unit. And then here's the X.264 conversion script that I used, and I tested from a quality perspective with medium, fast, and very fast. I don't think I included all those in the rate distortion curves. Very, very simple command string. Again, I used a one-second VBV buffer here to minimize the, the variation in the data rate. And for the software only on the GPU-optimized computer, you know, the, 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 G, the, the system that the soft vellum guys recommended for NVIDIA, I couldn't produce a single X.264 ladder with any preset. Um, why? Because it was optimized for graphics, not for CPU. Um, but I wanted to be fair to software, so what I did was come up with a configuration that cost about the same. So a C518 extra large um, would cost about a buck 25 an hour as compared to a buck 14 an hour, so that seemed like a, a reasonable machine to compare it to. And on that machine, I achieved four si simultaneous encodes with the software only. And this is, this is kind of what it looks like. You would just create separate instances, you know, you dial in via SSH, you create separate uh, windows to run your encodes, and as long as the frame rate was 55 or above, it was a successful encode. Now you can set your, you know, maybe you want 60 frames per second, maybe you want 57, whatever then your number is. But each of these is above 55, and then here's the CPU utilization. So bottom line was on that system, it was able to produce four encodes. So that means that each encode cost me about half of what the NVIDIA encodes, because NVIDIA produced two on the same price system, and uh, X.264 produced four. I spoke to NVIDIA. They basically said that the, the system I was working with was a, you know, it's like a two-year-old system, which in graphics terms is, is pretty slow at this point. They say they have a lot more high-performance hardware that's available. Um, and if, if you're doing this type of analysis, you're going to have to, again, start from scratch when it comes to pricing things out. You know, look at the most optimized machine. I, I trusted the soft film guys to figure out a, a good machine for me to work with. NVIDIA, of course, wanted to point me towards the latest and greatest. Um, and we'll look at the quality that was produced after we look at Intel QuickSync. So to produce the Intel QuickSync encodings, Intel, um, I spoke with them, and they set up systems for me to work with. So again, I had hoped to use all AWS systems so I could um, compare prices more easily, but getting the configuration set and getting the encoding string set, it seemed to make more sense to get it done right than to, to worry about the cost comparisons that were going to be probably not that relevant for, for users out there anyway. The system that I worked with on QuickSync was uh, <coughs> use this CPU, which obviously has the graphics chip included, and it's got 2 2x16x two, two uh, RAM configuration. 
And I accessed this via Docker. And this is the Open Visual Cloud is a big initiative by Intel that they recently launched. And basically, what the Docker containers did for me was it made it very simple to implement the new hardware, the, the new software, right? So I could load the Docker, and once I had the Docker loaded, because that was pre-configured, I could start encoding. I didn't have to encode, I didn't have to configure the instance as I needed it, I just loaded the Docker container and it was there. I think that's, you know, if you're looking at the QuickSync solution and if you're looking at the SV, SVT solution, we'll look at it in a few minutes, um, you probably want to check out the tools available on the Open Visual Cloud um, uh, website. So again, the first thing I wanted to do with Intel QuickSync was try and figure out which preset do, did I want to encode with. So there are seven presets that you see down here, and you know, starting with the table, preset one is the fast, low quality preset, so that produced 128 frames per second with a VMAP score of 73.75, and I'm sorry, this is the high quality, slow encode, and this is the high speed, low quality encode. And if you graph the results, this is the frame rate, this is the quality, you see that the frame rate gets, you know, you, this seemed to be a reasonable area to score. I didn't want to, I didn't want to test down here because I thought it would compromise quality. At preset four, I got pretty close to maximum quality while still getting pretty good performance. So I ended up testing at preset four. And then just to make sure I wasn't leaving any money on the table or any capacity on the table, I ended up testing at preset seven and wasn't able to get any more throughput than I got with, with, uh, with preset four. And Intel pr provided the script and you know what we're seeing again is we're decoding the file first into a raw format and then we're coding it into the Intel QuickSync H.264 format. Um, and then we used a one second buffer here for consistency with the previous encodes. And then on the tested computer, um, I was only able only to get one full encoding ladder with the QuickSync configuration at preset four. So didn't get a lot of throughput with that particular computer. Um, using preset seven did not deliver two full ladders. So I was kind of stuck on, on, um, on one ladder. With X.264, I couldn't get any complete ladders on this computer, even using the very fast preset. So at least I got a complete ladder with QuickSync, which I did not get with X.264. And Intel also pointed out that there are add-in boards and other solutions you can use to get higher capacity QuickSync encoding. And again, I tried to use uh, the AWS computers for consistency and pricing, but that, that kind of went away. So how did I test the quality? I tested the quality with four videos. Um, Netflix Dinner Scene, which is a video you can download from a bunch of different sites. Harmonic has a football clip that I use pretty frequently for testing. Grand Theft Audio and Video, which is a clip you can download for testing from a number of places. I think Twitch supplies this clip. And then a two minute segment from Netflix Meridian. And I encoded all of these at 1080p 60. So my encoding ladder had you know, 1080p 60, 1080p 30, 720p 30, but for the rate control or rate, rate distortion curves, I used all 1080p 60. And I tested from two to five megabits per second, and you'll see the results from four codecs. You'll see the NVENC codec, you'll see the QuickSync codec, and then you'll see X.264 at medium and very fast. The companies that I work with tend to want to know how things compare to medium because that's a, that's a big benchmark for them. I wanted to include very fast because I think that's the, the preset you're gonna use if you're trying to push capacity. <laughs> so here we get to the oohs and ahs in the presentation. Um, so this is, uh, this is the first rate distortion curve and, and I'll go through this one and then I kind of can click through. You can download this um, presentation now I'll go back and show you the, the bit.ly URL at the end of the presentation if you came in late. But what we're seeing is X.264 very fast is at the bottom of the scale, and the other three are kind of, kind of um, together in a range where you wouldn't notice any quality differences. So, you know, all of these are, are, are pretty reasonable quality. Here's the, the BD ray computations, and basically, you know, what you're seeing here is that 
Um, the NVIDIA encoder produced the highest quality output. It could produce the same quality as X.264 medium with a decrease in data rate of 2.42%. It could produce the same quality at QuickSync as with a reduction in data rate of about 8.94% and the same quality as X.264 very fast with a data rate reduction of 29.11. Okay, so that's what these numbers tell you. And the numbers, I'm not going to go through each diagram or in each, um, in each calculation. We'll do that kind of at the end. But the, the pattern really doesn't change. Here we're seeing quick sync fall behind. This was the toughest clip to encode, very high motion football clip. And you know, quick sync's falling behind here. And the numbers kind of reflect that. And then this is Grand Theft Audio and Video. If you're interested in, in gaming applications, again, they're clumped up here pretty tightly with uh, X.264 very fast down here. And then Meridian is a, a low motion movie. We're seeing a little bit more distance between these, these encodes. But again, X.264 very fast is down here. And then here's the overall rate distortion curve for all four tested clips. And by now, the pattern is pretty similar. You know, we see the, the top three over here, followed by the X.264 fast clip. And then overall, again, NVIDIA was our leader. Um, QuickSync was behind NVIDIA and X.264 medium, but ahead of X.264 very fast by about 19%. The other part of the analysis, again, is looking for transient quality issues. So what we're seeing here is a plot between NVIDIA at 3 megabits per second and very fast at 3 megabits per second. And very fast is the green clip, and we're seeing some regions where the green drops significantly. And what that tells you is that even though the overall scores, which we just looked at, were, were you know, they were definitely behind, but they were reasonable. There may be some areas where the, the quality of experience really drops because the frames are just ugly. Um, I looked at the actual frames in a lot of these dropping areas, and I didn't see a lot of visual differences. Um, on the other hand, the biggest problem I saw with QuickSync, and here we're looking at QuickSync in red, NVIDIA in green, are drops like these. So these are very, very significant, very, very low um, VMAP scores. And they translated to very noticeable quality differences. So here's the original. Here's NVIDIA. Here's QuickSync. So you know, not to maximize the effect, these are obviously very, very short. It's questionable whether anybody would notice one or two frames. But again, it's, you know, this is NVIDIA, this is QuickSync, this is NVIDIA, this is QuickSync. So that is a very substantial difference. Um, I tried to see if that was consistent to all applications and all videos. So this is Meridian at 4 megabits per second. This was the football clip at 3 megabits per second. Obviously a, a much harder to encode clip. Um, with Meridian, I saw some, so again, the, the red is going to be the QuickSync clip, the green is going to be the NVIDIA clip. We saw some reductions like here where the, where the NVIDIA clip had, had quality issues. Most of the big issues that we see here are in red. Going to the individual frames, one of the cool things about this tool is you just press this button, you can see the frames and toggle through original and both compressed. Looking at the frames, I didn't see any visual differences that were anywhere close to what I saw with the football clip. So, you know, what did this add up to? Um, the NVIDIA solution was slightly better than X.264 medium, um, about 10% better than QuickSync, and significantly better than X.264 very fast. And I do want to say this is the first time I've, I've tested hardware encoders at this level. 
Um, I did get command strings from either white papers or the vendors themselves, so I wasn't completely off the reservation, but um, I'm always uncomfortable the first time I test something. The, uh, the Intel performance was decent. You know, it wasn't, you know, they weren't substantially behind either NVIDIA or X.264 medium, but the transient quality would be a significant concern for me if I was looking at the Intel QuickSync solution. And I will say, you know, I did some research, you know, Googled Intel QuickSync transient quality issues, didn't see anything to confirm these type of issues, but I did see some documentation that said um, the overall quality of the QuickSync solution wasn't as good as some others out there. So I also, I ran this presentation by Intel and um, they didn't jump and scream and say, hey, that's wrong. So, you know, I, I think, I don't want to say Intel's moving away from the QuickSync platform. They're obviously moving towards the SVT platform we're going to be talking about in a minute. Um, I, I don't think that's the first time they've seen these issues, but, but I'm, I'm talking out of turn a little bit. So this is kind of X.264. If I was looking for a transcoding solution, um, I, would ex you know, I would look at the numbers for NVIDIA because if, if you can make the numbers work, I think the quality is there. Okay, for HEVC, I compared a company called NG Codec has an FPGA-based encoding solution. Uh, FPGA is a field programmable gate array. That's a piece of hardware that's on you know, an add-in board or a cloud computer that essentially it's programmable, but it's hardware as well. So it, it, it operates very quickly, almost like embedded hardware, but because it's field programmable, you can use it for a lot of different things which gets the cost down. <clears throat> and I compared that to Intel SVT HEVC, and we'll talk about what, it, what SVT HEVC is in a moment. And then just to kind of bring it back to X.265, which everybody's using, I, I compared it to X.265 as well. With SVT, I compared two presets. One is preset 10, which is used for live applications, and one is preset one, which is the highest quality. And we'll look at what that, what that looks like in a moment. So here's the, the computer I use for NG Codec. This was supplied by NG Codec. I just dialed in via SSH. Um, a 16 core AMD machine, uh, two field programmable gate arrays with, uh, with PCIe 16 LAN connections from the, from the CPA to the main uh, CPU. What I was able to get from a performance perspective was one full encoding ladder for each FPGA. Here's the NG Codec script that I use, and NG Codec provided this. There's no real toggle for quality and encoding speed with the NG Codec solution. It's either on or off, it's either full rate or nothing, and it's whatever quality you get at that rate. So what is Intel SVT HEVC? So at NEB, Intel and Netflix made a pretty big splash when they came out with the SVT slash AV1 codec that they said could transcode live at 4K 60p. And the reason that was a big deal was because <laughs> the fastest I'd have been able to get um, 1080p 30 encoding in software was about 20 times slower than HEVC. And, and the traditional knock on AV1 encoding has been very slow transcode times. So with Intel and Netflix coming out and saying live 4K 60p, that was, that was a really big deal, and it's based upon the SVT, or Scalable Video Technology Platform. So what, what this is, and I got a really good explanation from a, a guy who works from, <laughs> a guy who works with, with uh, Mozilla, and what he said was SVT is just a really efficient way to divide up encoding chores so it can be multi-processed on a, on a big CPU, right? So instead of using hardware, like QuickSync does, what Intel's done is they've adopted, they bought a company that had a technology that made encoding uh, very efficient from a multiprocessor perspective. So Intel could sell lots of CPUs with multiple cores because it was very efficient to encode uh, not only AV1, but also VP9, HEVC, and, and ultimately H.264. So Intel appears to be moving towards a platform that doesn't rely on graphics hardware in the chip as much as it relies on efficient 
utilization of multiple cores for the encode process. So here are my tests. There are 10 presets I can access in the, um, in the HEVC S, uh, SVT encode. And preset 10 is the fast, lower quality option. And preset 1 is the slow, high quality option. But again, we're not seeing a significant, well, we are seeing a significant difference. You know, the VMAF, a, a, a VMAF difference of six points is a just noticeable difference. So you should notice the difference between, in this case, 73.80 and 82.46. So you would, you would notice the difference in that case. Um, and again, where I tested was here for live and then here just to kind of understand where the quality would come out um, for even if you wanted to use this for VOD based encoding. And then to, to do this, it, in, pretty self-explanatory, but if you've never seen a, a, a chart like this before, what you do is you encode the file 10 times using the different presets. So the settings are the same, you use a different preset, and then you measure frame rate during the encode and quality after the encode. And what you're looking for here is like, you know, where's the ideal place to, to use, I mean, what's the ideal preset to use? And in this case, um, you know, it's a pretty decent range of, of, um, of quality differences, more than you usually see, but, you know, here we're at 81.35, here we're at 82.46, that's not, you know, we're, we're we're more than doubling the encoding speed, which means we're more than doubling the capacity, you may choose to encode at this preset just to get better performance than you would at this preset. And that's why I, I put these charts together before I start encoding with, with any codec. Intel provided the script, and um, the thing I did differently for HEVC is I, I doubled the buffer size. So the buffer size for H.264 was one second, and the buffer size for all of my all the uh, HEVC encodes I could I can access it were twice that. And the reason I did that was um, I spoke to an engineer at Brightcove who said you'd get better quality that way. I didn't see it as a huge deal either way, but I just wanted to try something different. Okay, the test system from Intel. For the SVT HEVC is here, and I was able to get three full encoding ladders in software at preset one. Um, when I tested X.265 very fast, it was under 30 frames per second. So SVT HEVC is very efficient, although the preset that I used, you know, the quality is. 73.8 as compared to 82.46. So there's definitely a compromise to quality if you get that level of performance. And here's what that looked like from a, you know, in the individual terminals that I got from the remote computer. And then here's the, here's the overall CPU utilization. For X.265, here's the script I used, nothing dramatic. Um, again, the VBB buffer size was 2x the data rate. HEVC quality results, same deal, four videos, um, all at 1080p60. Here I tested from one to four megabits per second instead of two to five. Um, and then four tested codecs, the NG codec solution, the SVT HEVC at one and 10, and the next dot 265 at very fast. I could not produce the one megabit per second um, SVT at quality one. I'm not really sure why, but but I couldn't produce that, so it's not it's not showing here, and it's not going to be in the. Um, I'll tell you how I adjusted the overall scores in a moment. But here, what we're seeing is the SVT at level one was the best quality, and. Next was X.265 very fast, NG codec was third, and then 
SVT level one, which is the real time uh, HTBC encoding, is down here significantly behind um, NG codec. So the kind of the fair comparison is NG codec, which is in blue, and SVT HTBC level 10, which is the real time. So here we're seeing NG codec is, is substantially faster, I'm sorry, substantially higher quality at, at real time performance as compared to the SVT HEVC at level 10. And we'll look at the, what the numbers look like in a second. There's nothing in here because we didn't get the four encodes. Um, pretty much the same pattern. Well, let me go back. So here with football, this drops even further behind. Again, SBT, HEBC at level one is the, is the top quality. Um, can produce the same quality as level 10 at, at a 34.42% data rate reduction. Here's GTAB, Grand Theft Auto Video. Same pattern, um, SBT 10 <coughs> is actually improving in quality a little bit. And then Meridian, which is the, the slow motion kind of movie scene, you know, tight grouping here with um, SVT level one really dropping behind. And here are the overall, you know, here's the overall graph. And these numbers here don't include dinner scene because dinner scene didn't have the complete ladder that was lacking the one megabit per second clip. But what we're seeing is that, you know, that the if the true comparison is between NG codec here and level 10 SVT HEVC here, then um, NG codec can produce the same quality as X.265 very fast, or I guess this is the most relevant one. Basically, NG codec can produce the same quality as SVT HEVC level 10 at a data rate reduction of 24.87. So if you're looking at the real-time hardware encoders, NG codec is substantially ahead, ahead of the SVT HEVC. Now, does either, any of these codecs exhibit the same problems we saw with QuickSync with H.264? Um, loaded the codecs up. Here we're looking at um, SV, SVT HEVC is in red, and, and the uh, NG codec is in green. Certainly, we're seeing a lot more downward spikes in red, which means, you know, which is scary. It makes it look like the um, SVT HEVC codec could have issues, but whenever I went to look at the frames, there weren't the visual differences that we saw with QuickSync. So it's, it, it, I didn't have the same level of concern. And this is the football clip, which kind of caused all the problems with, with, uh, with QuickSync. So I, I don't really see, I would, I would always check for transient quality issues before I adopted a new encoder, but I didn't, see, I didn't see any here that were concerning. So what's the bottom line? From my perspective, hardware encoding showed, showed pretty significant promise. Um, for H.264, NVIDIA worth, was worth exploring. Intel, not so much. I think QuickSync, um, from my perspective, it had lower, um, lower overall quality and it had those transient quality issues that are, that are pretty concerning. For HEBC, NG codec was the best solution for live encoding. Um, you know, produced the highest quality live real-time stream. SVT, HEBC, the real-time quality needs improvement, but it's a brand new, you know, it's a brand new codec. It's a pretty new initiative, so you would expect it to improve over time. And it looks, you know, it looks really competitive from uh, with X.265. But of course, you'd, you wouldn't use X.265 for VOD at very fast. You would use probably very slow or slow or maybe even medium. So I need to, I need to compare it to medium and slow for a true comparison. And I'll, I'll run those tests for an upcoming article I have in streaming media, which is due at the end of the month. So I'll confirm all these tests, run a couple more, and print that up in an article you can read sometime in, in uh, July or August. And then, you know, I had hoped to come up with a costing, you know, pricing structure and a cost structure that you guys could take away with you and say, well, this is, but really I just couldn't because I used so many different machines. They didn't really, they didn't really translate to any kind of uh, cohesive price. So you're going to have to do your own testing. Hopefully, 
you know, the, the performance quality graphs that are cited here plus the results will give you, you know, some good, a good starting point to, to do your own, your own testing. Any questions? Make sure that they tried CBR. Have you looked up the same thing for HEVC? So, did, did I make sure that the HEVC bit rates were CBR? Um, not for this analysis. I'll do that for the article. <laughs> Good question. So did NG Kodak give me an idea on pricing? Um, no, but there, I, I looked at their FPGA-based solution for VP9 encoding a few times, and the pricing was reasonable. So I don't, I don't think they're, but you're, it's getting to be a competitive market. I don't think they're going to be the only FPGA-based solution out there, and so. So available on AWS. Say it again? NG Kodak license is available on AWS. That's right. That's, that's what I meant to say. And it, it, it is pretty, it, it, I did some testing and, and it, was, it was reasonable in the, in the buck, two buck an hour pricing. Anybody else? Okay, thank you for your attention.